This video is for the third subtopic of atomic structure, 2.3 electron arrangement. In this subtopic, we discuss the Bohr model of the atom, and in support of that model, we also discuss the phenomena of emission spectra and ionization energies. The Bohr model was invented by this man, Niels Bohr. He was a giant of early 20th century physics and was a key figure in establishing quantum physics. He also had a few friends that were no slouches in the brain department. This is the Bohr model of the atom. It's a lot like what we've seen before, but there's three key features. According to the Bohr model, all atoms have discrete electron energy levels. Each level can hold a specific number of electrons, and these levels are spaced apart in a fixed pattern. Let's look at each one of these points in more detail. The electron energy levels of atoms are discrete, which means that the electrons can only travel in these specific levels. They can jump between them, but they cannot go in between them. Each one of these levels can fit a specific number of electrons. As we've already learned, when we called them shells, the first level can hold two electrons, the second can hold eight, and the third can hold eight again. So these are the electron arrangements of some of the elements early in the periodic table. Helium has two electrons in the innermost shell, while beryllium has two more electrons in the second shell, and so on and so forth. The spacing of these energy levels has a fixed pattern. Notice how the gap between the innermost electron levels is bigger than the successive gaps between the outer electron levels. To understand the Bohr model better, we need to consider some evidence for it which includes energy, spectra, and electron arrangement. A continuous spectrum is just what the name sounds like, a spectrum without any breaks or gaps. Emission and absorption spectrum, however, do have breaks or gaps in them. In an absorption spectra, lines are missing that have been absorbed by something in between the light source and us, the viewers. Emission spectrum are almost all black space and only have light in those same lines, something has emitted light of very specific wavelengths. Here's one example of a wave, and here's another. Our first example has a short wavelength and a high frequency, while our second example has a long wavelength and a low frequency. What does that mean? Well, here's the equation that describes all waves. Lambda is the wavelength of the wave. And again, our first example has a short one, and our long example second example has a long wavelength. F is the frequency of the wave. If it takes 10 seconds for these examples to pass us, then our first example would have a frequency of 10 per second because there are 10 waves, while our second example would have a frequency of 2.5 per second. C is the speed of the wave. Both these examples have the same speed. What's different though is that our first example has higher energy while our second example has a lower energy. Higher energy in the visible spectrum looks purple to us, while lower energy looks red. The real speed of light in a vacuum is 2 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, nearly 20 million meters per second. Remember how the electron energy levels are spaced out in the Bohr model? Well, imagine an electron at one of these outer levels jumping down to a lower level. When it jumps down, it's going to release some high-frequency, high-energy light that might look purple to us. An electron that makes a shorter jump will release lower-frequency, lower-energy light that might look red to us. Here is the complete emission spectrum of the hydrogen atom. On the right-hand side, we see the visible spectrum taken in this photograph. On the left-hand side, we have a diagram, what's known as the Balmer series, which involves all electron jumps down to the second energy shell, the second energy level, n equals 2. These are what produce the lines in the visible spectrum. And you can see there's one red line, one blue line, and two in the purple or violet range. The Lyman series and the Passion series produce, respectively, lines in the ultraviolet and infrared ranges. The atoms of every element have their own unique emission spectra, which we can use like a fingerprint. Here we have several examples from group one and group two of the periodic table. This is the full spectrum of the sun. Notice that we're looking at a very zoomed in version here. 
Of course, the spectrum is normally laid out in one long line, but here we have line after line after line, leading from the deep red all the way to the high purple or violet. All of these black lines are where different elements in the sun's atmosphere have absorbed different energy from the light as it's passed from the core of the sun to us. So here we have a literal composite fingerprint of all the elements in the solar atmosphere. Our next piece of evidence for the Bohr model is ionization energy. To ionize an atom, we need to pull off an electron, and now we have a positive cation. Of course, some atoms have several electrons. For example, an aluminum atom has 13 electrons. The energy it takes to pull off one electron is called the first ionization energy. The energy for the second electron is called the second ionization energy, and so on and so forth. There are patterns to be found in these serial ionization energies. Let's use aluminum again, but now let's graph the energy it takes to pull off successive electrons. The first thing we notice, each electron requires more energy than the previous one to pull off. What's the second thing we notice about this pattern? There's a big gap between the third and fourth ionizations of aluminum. That's when we ran out of electrons in the third, fourth shell and started pulling electrons from the third shell. There's another big gap right before the last two electrons. That's when we finished pulling electrons from the second shell and started to pull them from the first shell. That's it. Thank you for watching.